Perfect. Um, two minutes past the hour. Good afternoon, good morning for those online, and good evening for whoever is connecting from different time zones. Um, welcome to this session where we're looking at uh, discussing together on how we will um, brainstorm on the ideas and, and, and the sort of initiatives that will, you know, help us navigate the future of information management in humanitarian ecosystems. Um, I'm Guido, I work myself for IMAP, and I'm delighted to be here today to moderate this uh, panel discussion. Uh, for those online, please do ask questions in the chat. We're monitoring the chat, and we basically can take those questions. You can as well unmute yourself when we have the question answer uh, session if you want to, to actually intervene directly yourself. Um, and uh, for those in the room as well, feel free to as well interrupt whenever you feel so necessary, just raise your hand and maybe if you can uh, give uh, your name and the organization you work for um, and feel free to interact with the panel members that we have here today. Um, <clears throat> let's go with the first technical glitch. Future is there. Yeah. Perfect. Um, today, um, we have uh, a very uh, experienced uh, panel um, that is set up over here. I have uh, on my right, uh, Mohamed Bello, the uh, country representative for Jordan. Jeffrey, I think a lot of you might know him, Villaveses, he is the country representative for Colombia, and he as well has an oversight on another few countries in the region. And then we have Bertrand Rucundo, who is our head at the global level for everything that is related to innovation, technology, and business development. Perfect. Um, with no further ado, I will start with a diagram that I think a lot of you are familiar with, the humanitarian program cycle. And this diagram is crucial in terms of positioning the way we do humanitarian coordination at the country level, at the operational level. And as you can see, information management uh, is at the center of this. What does information management mean, though? What are we looking at? Um, information management, when it was defined with the HPC um, almost um, slightly more than a decade ago, had a specific reference to what it was. Are we still looking at information management with the same lens and eyes as of today? Are the set of competencies, the set of profiles that we're looking at the same ones? Um, so this panel discussion will really try to, to sort of demystify how things are evolving, not only in the world of information management, but as well in the broader humanitarian ecosystem in terms of how do we support scales up to better, better support the decision makers and to be more operationally relevant so that we can save lives in a more timely, in a more efficient and a more cost efficient manner as well while engaging as well with those who are themselves affected by the disaster so that we can avoid having a top-down approach. Information management, if we look at um, how it is basically pictured in, in, in terms of a diagram, in terms of a flow, we're referring to all the process that basically gets and starts from the data collection, the data cleaning, the processing of data, the component that is related to the analysis so that we can basically then visualize, create products and transform the data into information. And then obviously we're looking at what it actually means in terms of making sense of the data um, so that we are as well able to, 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 to basically put aside the noise that is you know, generated with all these data flows, this information that today is existing. And that's another game changer. 10, 15 years ago, we would struggle in collecting data. Today, we are here making, trying to make sense of how much data is existing and actually what we need and what we need to pick to be able to structure decision-making processes in a more effective manner. If we uh, look at how you know some of these things can be broken down, we can get into more complicated, sophisticated diagrams such as this one that I won't go into the details of it. But basically, the process is not as simple as the slide that was pictured before. It can get really complicated. It can get really, really 
very much into the nitty dt gray tails. If we Google um, an information management cycle, there is actually no standard process that is commonly agreed, uh, that is a reference. Uh, these are examples from various organizations, various uh, you know, data literacy uh, websites that refer and, and interpret their information management cycle in their own manner. So today, once again, I'm very delighted to be here uh, to moderate this panel discussion. We will have three case studies, uh, respectively from Colombia, uh, the way we at IMAP do innovation uh, with one specific concrete case study from Afghanistan. And then we will as well look at how in uh, the Middle East, in Jordan, we have as well uh, been looking at the whole process of information management and how we can as well disrupt the way that we've been doing traditional information management in the humanitarian ecosystem by leveraging technology, by leveraging new methods, new tools, by engaging with communities on the ground, by utilizing the private sector. I think everybody is now familiar with chat GPT. It's the buzzword. I think I heard it thousands of times um, this week. We need to as well be cautious about what the limitations are of all these tools, these processes, what the risks are when it comes to humanitarian actors and how can we mitigate those risks. So without further ado, uh, I'll hand it over to Jeffrey to initiate the process. And uh, once again, feel free to interrupt. It's, it's, you know, we have one hour and a half together. Let's have this become a joint conversation with question and answers and feel free to interrupt whenever you feel necessary. Thank you. Hello? Yeah, okay, so thank you very much, Guido. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I've already made a presentation earlier and uh, yesterday on community engagement. And today I'm going to bring try to bring in a number of things around three <clears throat> main pillars um, that I think are changing information management today and, and have the potential to revolutionize how relief is delivered in the future. Um, one is, and I'll, I'll illustrate all these three with, uh, with the very few slides I have here, which are three slides. One is, um, related to partnerships with with private sector companies. So taking advantage, how can one question I think is how can we take advantage of the the advances that the private sector has had? As usual, I think that the humanitarian sector is a bit behind the curve on technology. Um, there's an awareness obviously in this group of people who are here in CICG about a lot of the potential of it, but um, but it hasn't been implemented as much. And so the question is going to be, how can we um, take advantage of the technology that's out there? Um, and the private sector pro uh, partnership process for information management specifically um, needs a lot of work, I would argue. I think there, there are different um, organizations such as NetHope, for example, which has done a lot for connectivity for, for example, but information management and what it means in getting it to decision makers, getting the information that is gathered to the decision makers that need to have it is very complex. It's very complex. And we combine that with uh, community engagement. So that's the presentation I made yesterday, uh, which is focused on the desire, which is very evident to have communities take a leadership role in decision making around assistance. It's nice as a buzzword, it's very interesting as a concept, but in practice, how how much is this being implemented? How meaningful are the decisions that communities can make? I would argue that technology is the root for um, effectively bringing communities in and having them make decisions. And that means that we need to change who the protagonists are in the entire process. This whole humanitarian programming cycle is organization focused. So even for my map, I often make the observation that we're generally understood to be a humanitarian to humanitarian organization, H to H. Is that the best orientation? Or should we be a community engagement organization? We could be both for a while as well. We could facilitate community engagement within other organizations. But what does that mean? There's a lot to really unpack and analyze as far as how that can 
can become a reality. But the tools are there. The technology is there. It's a question of uh, how can we how can we make it a reality? And the third just has to do with a lot of the new technology. What I like about generative AI is that it's uh, it allows for creativity. I think that the future is not going to be just with engineers. I think it's going to be with artists, with people who really have um, creative ideas. And they're going to have tools that allow them to engage with information management in a way that was never possible before. So, and I think generative AI is the reason, the way they're going to be doing it. That's the reason I'm more excited about that than crypto or blockchain or any of the other recent technological innovations that have been out there, is that it allows people to, in a record time, really, um, really create something, you know, and with fewer people. And I don't think it's going to create massive employ unemployment, but that's a whole nother discussion. Uh, <laughs> so um, this is this is a pilot that we did that I think this is the most exciting project we have as far as use of technology in um, in Colombia. We have it as a regional project. Currently, it's in Colombia, Panama, and Costa Rica. And the, I don't know if you're familiar with the context of the migration towards the United States from Colombia, from Venezuela, principally, but not only. Now, there are a whole bunch of countries that uh, Haitians were actually the, the primary population that was originally trying to go to the U.S. through uh, starting out in Brazil. Interestingly, from all the way back from the World Cup, there was a big group of Haitians that went there and worked. And then they decided, hey, there, there's actually it actually makes sense to try to go to the U.S. from Brazil. And a lot of others are catching on, let's say. You can see videos on TikTok that show uh, how to get through the Darien. Uh, how long does it take to get here? What is it like if I go with the with this organization or that organization? A lot of concerns there, like what is the information being given? But the reality is, is that people are finding ways to share information about what their experience is and trying to go to the U.S. That's that's the way I would summarize it. The question is, um, so UNICEF was interested in looking at ways, new ways of looking at um, the migration pattern. So the traditional way is you put a few people in different different locations to collect information and then it, um, border crossing points. But the qu one question is, how do you know where the border crossing points are, right? So if, uh, if people, for, for example, are being suppressed, they, they go after them in the one or another place, well, they're going to change where they go. So you're going to have a lot of confusion there when you try to get people. So this whole area there, um, we have the, the main departure point is pretty much determined, which is Necocli, but it's not the only one. There are actually people go to the other, other side here, which is interesting, the Choco side, which is in the middle of the jungle. And there are people, it, it, horror stories of people trying to go that way. It's just insane, you know, it, it, because every single time they take a boat to go to the next town they say oh we'll take you to panama uh, just give us 500 more dollars and then they don't take them to panama they take them a little bit further and then they do it again and again and again and again so you have all these desperate people asking for relatives to give them money so they have you, you have that's like the less tread areas are actually worse but it's amazing how people will go uh, to almost any length to 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 try to migrate, you know, after they've started the trip, they'll go. Um, so the the we have here a number of traditional data collection points. What we did was we started working with. Um, I'll show you what's up. So we have different places where UNICEF is working directly with these uh, the migrants. And they have specific man a mandate as UNICEF, which is focused upon um, uh, children and adolescents and profiling them and understanding their needs, pre-positioning assistance. So uh, this can all be understood to be in the context, I'd say, of uh, anticipatory action as well. I know that was one of the one of the questions. If this panel was going to deal at all with anticipatory action, I'd say definitely that this technology is moving that direction. If you look. With community com, uh, communication with affected communities, the survey that was done originally with migrants, very clear that more people receive their information over WhatsApp than any other way. Radio, TV, whatever, they go through WhatsApp and Facebook as well. 
Um, and so we looked at using WhatsApp to uh, basically put a QR code in different locations um, and having people um, not download an additional application, which is a burden, right? And also takes up space on your phone. Um, but using WhatsApp, which you also have to take into account, is a tool that, as a, a communication tool, it's the most economical because uh, even after your data runs out or your text messages or whatever would run out, you can still have a week. Uh, to give you an idea, in Colombia, I don't know exactly the, the exact price in each country, but it's around 25 cents for one week. You get a top up. That is accessible. Um, you know, so that's why migrants. They they don't cut off your your it's two thousand pesos. They don't cut off your um, your access to WhatsApp after your data is used. So people continue to use the WhatsApp is the only. Oh, and they also often include other things like Facebook and Waze. But the the goal here is to have make use of a chat bot. So we we created a a chat bot. A lot of chat bots are are coming up and coming. And I think this is the way surveys are going to be done more and more in the future. Um, and at the end of the day, it gives us information. But what do we give them? We're an information-based organization. Well, what makes sense is to give them information. So we worked with Premise Data as well um, to collect information at different points and to understand the offerings, the response uh, capacity in different locations. Giffem and others and R4V have have serve, have maps already of where there's um, available uh, assistance. So when we receive information of where a migrant is, it, we ask them also where they have received assistance. That gives us a new data point, and then we go look at that data point, and so and we update the the locations that we have. Um, so the the question there is basically. We're giving them information in exchange for information. We don't have a cash. If you, ideal, if you have a cash-based transfer program, for example, everyone's going to sign up. <laughs> That's what happened with NRC, for example. They used the WhatsApp chatbot for beneficiary identification um, because people want to be in the cash-based transfer program. So they'll give a lot of information in exchange for that. Um, and so I'll, I'm not going to give you the details of uh, of all the uh, of all the results, but I'll give you a general idea, like exactly what we can uh, what we can get out of that. So, what can we offer them? You know, you can see different different areas there, and what can we demand from them? So, the supply and the demand, as far as what we can do with an information exchange, and this is something that really is um, easy to update. So, you have a lot of information flowing through, and you have a lot of geolocation information, and you have the ability to identify new border crossing points, um, which you would not have if you just have people stationary in different locations to be collecting data. And the goal, this is where, I mean, obviously, there's going to be more, much more work. This has only been since uh, January we've been doing this. We've done other chatbots in the past for cash-based transfer beneficiary identification like they did with Ukraine. But um, the so over time, I think that the, the potential here, the idea is that this is going to be expanded to some other countries. They have to be defined exactly which ones they will, which ones they will be. But it's sort of funny because UNICEF has to decide, for example, which country offices are interested in adding um, this functionality. But and so UNICEF Mexico, maybe, maybe not. They have to analyze it. There's a bit of concern on the part of the government. But in reality, uh, we already have thousands of data points in Mexico. It, why? Because people move. <laughs> and so when they share, share, I don't have information on all the uh, supply or all the locations where they can get assistance in Mexico, but I have information from the people moving through Mexico. It's so they don't, uh, you know, if you're already moving, you're going through all these countries one way or the other. And so you're going to have a lot of location data shared. And it tells you a story, you know, because right now you look at it like this HPC cycle, the humanitarian programming cycle, it's country by country, right? So you, lo you lose context. What happens in Nicaragua? It's a black hole. What happened? What happened to all these migrants? They go through Panama, they're going a bus. People want to get them out. So they say, put them on a bus. 
They go on the bus, they go to the border of Costa Rica, put them on a bus. And then they get to Nicaragua and then, well, no one wants to stay in Nicaragua apparently, so they don't, they don't put them on a bus. They just like say, threaten them so they have to get out of there. But uh, at the end of the day, the question is, how do you tailor the assistance? And and so we're getting information that needs, and there's a responsibility to how, how you tailor a response as well. Um, I think that's... That's about it for me, and I don't know. I think we'll do questions later, but that's the case study I wanted to share. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so uh, Jeff is talking about how do we engage the community. So what I'm going to talk about is the community, but I'm going to talk about the humanitarian community. So uh, let's step back a bit and uh, let's give us uh, a scenario. Uh, I see a lot of IMOs and uh, we are all humanitarian in the room. Uh, let's just say country X, there is a disaster. Uh, let's say there is an earthquake. Uh, what happens? We have emergency teams that are deploying on the field. Uh, they are setting up data collection uh, systems. Uh, we have IMOs uh, that need to be recruited. You get them on the field, they set up all the systems, analyze data, create dashboards. Uh, when they are creating dashboards or maps, they are reaching out, oh, does anyone have uh, the COD or the different admin boundaries of this country? And X forever. And it's painful. And here I'm talking about the big organizations, right? But imagine the national NGOs, the local NGOs that are actually first responders. They live there, they live in that community. They don't have the resources to hire GIS experts. They don't have the capacity to get these expensive softwares that can be used to process and respond and provide this information that is much needed on the field, on the ground. So what happens with them? Uh, it's trying to respond to these needs that uh, the platform I'm going to introduce right now was made. Uh, this, um, the platform is called uh, HSDC, Humanitarian Special Data Center. Uh, it was implemented, it's still being implemented in Afghanistan. Uh, it's graciously supported by our friends at uh, USID. BHA, and uh, what does it do? Uh, the platform, it helps, it's a disaster risk management platform. Uh, what, I, I mean, to simplify it, I would say it puts back the information in the hands of the users, the humanitarian community. And those users don't have to be experts. Let's say, uh, I'll just say what it does and then I'll explain, I'll give some examples. So it's a disaster risk management platform. So instead of going around looking for the information that is much needed when a disaster hits, this platform will provide all the information that is needed beforehand, before actually the disaster happens. Uh, it, helps, uh, it helps us to be more proactive Instead of waiting when a disaster hits and then you going around trying to find all the information you need to respond, uh, the platform is a central database of all this geospatial data that is much needed when responding to a disaster or maybe even responding to other needs. It doesn't even have to be disaster response, it can be other uh, humanitarian or even development related needs. And then uh, it can be, it's, it's also made with the purpose to be uh, a risk forecasting platform. And uh, with some, um, I'm trying to keep it uh, as simple as possible. So the platform is feeding data from live, uh, public, uh, publicly available data. Uh, some of these data sets are updated like every two minutes, every five minutes. So some information it's almost live and uh, it's feeding into the platform i will show uh, the platform how it's made uh, the platform is made uh, with open source uh, technology and it's 
freely available to humanitarian uh, organizations uh, in the country. So uh, what does it do? Um, let's say you are a protection officer in, um, in Afghanistan, you are deployed and you are wondering where, where um, what location has most children that could be at risk of, uh, let's say it's winter and you are planning, let's say, uh, some activities and you are wondering, how am I going to do this? In a typical traditional way, you will reach out to the IMO in uh, your protection uh, agency or protection cluster or, you know, in your, in your, in your, in your organization. And then that's if you like, you have an IM person. And if you don't have an IM person, then you need to do it yourself. And then it takes, even if you ask your IM person, the person will go around, try to compile the data, get you the product. But then what we are doing with the platform, it's putting the power in the hands of the humanitarian actors. What you can do, you can open the platform, you, there is a dashboard, and then you can pick, you can select what you need. So you can uh, triangulate population data, uh, weather, uh, landslide risk, avalanche risk, earthquake, uh, accessibility, and so on. So you can pick different uh, thematic uh, risk, and then uh, you can tailor them to a specific area, a province or a, uh, a, a smaller geographical area, and then you can have a dashboard that you can easily use for your decision making, or you can put in your presentation, in your report, in your advocacy uh, documents. And at the same time, the data behind this dashboard is easily downloadable. You can download it. You can download the dashboard. You can you can use that quick, simple IM product for your needs. Is it perfect? Maybe not. Is the pie chart can be improved? Maybe. But then the idea is not about being perfect. The idea is about being able to respond as soon as possible and have that information handy whenever you need it. And so on the platform, you get multiple type of products, you get dashboards, uh, you get uh, interactive maps. These maps, uh, this is just an example. Uh, on the screenshot, if you can look here, I just, I just selected Kabul as the area and then the web platform will select the region. And then I was like, uh, I, you have different type of layers. So I selected seismic intensity, I selected the roads, I selected the population density. So using, I mean, I just selected these three. We have uh, multiple, multiple type of layers. So just selecting these, in case there is uh, an earthquake in Kabul, we already know which area is most at risk. You see the area that is red, and then you see the roads, the accessibility, you can also access uh, security information and different, I mean, I'm just giving like a few examples. So there is a lot, of, I mean, there is a huge amount of uh, data points that can be used uh, according to your needs. And then that map you see over there, I can actually, it's, it's an interactive map. You can, you can select, let's say, um, settlements and you can see the different settlements of people. You can put your mouse on the, on the map. You can see how many people are there. And you can even download this data in Excel format, or you can use it in your other products. So this is just an example of what you can do. Uh, there is uh, another feature called uh, Settlement Inspector. So in this settlement inspector, you do the same thing. It's dynamic, you, you select a point. Let's say you are a security officer, and then you have staff that are traveling to the field, and they need to know, is this road available? I mean, is this road accessible? Uh, was there an avalanche the past two days? Uh, can we, this is how you can use this kind of tool to, to have an overview in a very quick and fast uh, matter. Uh, this is another tool, so it's a uh, static maps. So you can download different maps and these maps, you select the layer, you select what kind of, what regional 
uh, area you need, and then it will make the tool, it will make the map for you with all the different features. So the data behind this, we are using publicly available data sets. Some data sets are not, we get the data sets from publicly available data sets, data sets but also from other partners like PDC, like uh, Premise, sometimes they provide some as data, Dif different, different partners can provide data to us and we feed into this kind of platform. So um, why are we talking about the platform today? Uh, we talk, I mean, this is not a typical, it doesn't fit in the typical traditional way we're doing information management. We're giving back the IAM products, putting it in the hands of the end users. Yeah, um, thank you. I will hand over back to Bello for... Uh... Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I've seen some faces from my presentation earlier this week, and uh, I'm going to borrow some slides also to show. Uh, maybe if you notice this uh, panel is mainly consist of iMappers and all from iMap, but what make it also special that we are working with different organization and in different crises. So there is some sort of a diversity of topics uh, and more focused on information management and the application of information management uh, in a global level. Um, so my example, like thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey and Petra for your presentations. I'm going to touch base on the last example that we have. I'm not going to spend that much time. I'm just going to run you through two slides to show an example of what we are implementing, not in Jordan, basically, it's basically in Syria and more focused on a specific cluster, which is a food security cluster. Uh, we have one of the projects, the project that we have is funded by BHEA. It's uh, focused on food security and food security information. And we produce few products uh, such as um, the integrated price monitoring, wheat and bread uh, uh, processing facilities, uh, map and wheat barley processing facilities and so on. So uh, to do this, we're doing it some sort of a remote exercise while we are based in Jordan, uh, utilizing the capacities of our partners on the ground and also some of the private sectors uh, in Syria to be able to collect the data, analyze it, and visualize it. Uh, this is kind of, if it sounds maybe a bit like traditional life cycle of, uh, of an information management with some tweaks that we adopt and some additional uh, techniques that we added on the top so we'll be able to produce this specific uh, uh, products or information products. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at the product development pipeline, it's divided into three block blocks or um, parts or stages. The first one, uh, as usual, like preparation, and I'm pretty sure most of you are able to suggest or to like to guess what is in the preparation part, collection and analysis and reporting. Maybe if I ask the audience now, they'll be able to like, oh, okay, we can put this in here and put there. But anyway, I'm just gonna run you through it very quickly. Uh, first of all, the concept development to develop a concept about specific product, like for example, the wheat and barley facility mapping, discuss it with the cluster, with the partners, decide about it, what need to be out of it and so on. And then study uh, and plan the product do the necessary coding for the data collection and so on, and then train our data collection uh, partners on to how collecting this specific data. Uh, then coordinates the data collection, and this is one of the toughest uh, process that we need to do because you need to coordinate some data collection exercise while you are in a remote modality, uh, moving to data cleaning and follow up, making sure that everything is fine and then provide the feedback if anything need to be recollected or verified and so on. And then data analysis using some tools that has been adopted for a long time that facilitates the process. Uh, then data visualization followed by report writing, report fact sheets, dashboards and so on. Production, they out in the product or the project or the report in a way that more appealing and inviting for the audience to read. And then dissemination, which is basically 
conducted by our partner or the cluster specifically. The strengths of IMAP Jordan slash Syria is basically this part where we have some tools that in-house developed to facilitate this and some SOPs and procedures that follow to make sure that this information has been collected perfectly. Uh, that's it. This is the two slides. I'm not going to go further on more details, but at the bottom line, as you see from Syria, Colombia, Afghanistan, different applications with different possibilities, with different opportunities, different techniques. But at the end of the day, there is no specific standard. It's everywhere because I am or information management is able to observe all types of uh, technologies on it. Uh, so audience, who is humanitarian here? Of course, everyone, right? Maybe a bit of private sector. And who is an IM focused? Raise your hand, please. One, two. OK, interesting. <laughs> so we're expecting more of IM people that they would like to learn about IM. OK, at least actually everybody is an IM as long as you have an Excel sheet that you're working with or you're reading maps or whatever, like you are an IM. Let's agree on that. So you as an IM person, tell me what is the main challenges that you have while you are working with IM? Just a one keyword. Use your mobile, mobile phone, scan this code, put the word there and let, tell me what you think. And those who are online as well, you can do that, of course. This will help us to trigger the discussion. Of course, data quality, amazing security. Mm -hmm. Coordination, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. <laughs> Accuracy, of course, data quality, timeline. This is two main issues. I'm pretty sure that even as a lot of perception. Mismatch admin boundaries across there. This is an Ocho person. Who's, who said that? <laughs> Mismatching the admin boundaries across data set. I'm pretty sure this is Ocho person. <laughs> data quality, timelines, accuracy, of course. Data accuracy. Amazing. I think now we came up with the main recommendation from our panel, right? OK, so I'm just going to leave the floor to our moderator to lead from here on. And if you have any questions, of course, please. Any questions, comments? Uh, this is a panel, yes, but of course, all of you are involved in this discussion. OK. So over to you. Thank you, Bello, Jeff, and Bertrand. Um, I think while this is getting still filled in, maybe I see online, Olivier, you have um, raised a long comment. Do you want to maybe intervene and you unmute yourself and you can maybe uh, talk through your points, Olivier? Is that possible technologically wise? I guess so. I think I so. Think can, so. You can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you, Olivier. Well, thanks for, well, thanks for um, um, thanks for thanks for I put down as down as a comment comment because, because, because I didn't want to didn't want to interrupt. interrupt. I really, I really uh, like the, the points that that you made. Thank you very, very much for, for the presentations. presentations. Uh, Jeff, uh, especially, especially your point around point creativity. Around creativity. Um, um, I guess the, I guess what I what I wrote in there was in there about, the about the fact that, that in, in looking, at looking ahead, we are our main limitation, limitation is our is creative. creative. Our, our, our technology, technology allows, allows us to do most, do most things, things, but these things, 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 things that we can't imagine, imagine, it's, imagine it's, it's all about, about how, how we, we formulate, formulate questions the questions that we ask, that we ask about, about technology, technology now. Um, and, and the uh, point that I was making in the text was that we are lacking a community as a form or definition 
of, of our use our cases, cases of a framework, of a framework where we can, where we can actually, actually define, define use, cases use cases to which to we which can, we then, can develop then develop solutions. solutions. So for us, so for more us demand, demand driven, we need, we need to, to be able to be able formulate, to formulate that demand better, 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 and we need to understand, understand what, what dimension, dimension of an information, of an information management use case. Use case. And I think and this, I think this is, is, so we've, so we've, the community has existed, existed for what, 20, 25 years, years, now. years now. It's been a very it's organic, been organic growth, growth and sort of, sort of um, uh, development, development process. process. And it, and might, it might be time, time for us to talk of, of what we've learned, what we've learned, more importantly, what are the dimensions, dimensions of work, of work that we do. That we so, do. so what I'm suggesting, what I'm suggesting in the text there is there is the dimensions you mentioned, you mentioned already, the already the the program, program cycle, you mentioned, you mentioned the management cycle, 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 there's also the disaster risk management, management, management cycle, cycle, cycle prevention, prevention, anticipation, preparedness, preparedness response, response, recovery, there's the dimension, the analytical dimension, there's the thematic of work dimension. So as we untangle these different, these different dimensions, dimensions, we can then, we can then recombine, recombine them into the very specific, very specific use, cases use cases that allow us to allow reference, reference solutions, solutions, reference, solutions reference good practice, practice. Um, and, 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 and more and deliberately, more deliberately learn, learn from one, from one another against, against those particular use cases. cases. And also and identify, identify where there are gaps, where are gaps. more deliberately, more deliberately identify, identify where, where a combination, a combination of, of these dimensions, dimensions needs to know solutions. That's where we need to work on and develop. So I so suppose, I suppose the, the, the to wrap that up, wrap I guess, that up, I guess the, the point I'm making is can we can we collectively come up, come up with, with a framework, framework like that? Like can, that? We, can, we can we develop, develop a framework, framework that can angle angle the different the dimensions, dimensions of information, of information management use, use cases? Thank you, Olivier. For those who don't know, Olivier is a director at Esri uh, here in Geneva. <clears throat> and um, so, yeah, Jeff, do you want to react to that point? Um, Thank you, Olivier. That was uh, that was great to listen to you uh, take apart and analyze how that how we can improve uh, IM. And I think all those points that you mentioned are relevant. Um, mm. What can I add? I mean, it, it's it's basically a question about. I agree with you that that um, we need to to dissect the thing a new way. And we need to use the tools that we have. When I'm thinking about community engagement, I'm thinking about uh, as far as demand driven, how do we orient um, all of our work towards the communities that we serve? And how do we actually um, listen to them with the technology that exists in a way that's responsive? So when we talk about the meaningful leadership roles that they're expected to play and that they're supposed to be engaged in in the entire response from the from the design phase through the delivery, uh, that sa that sounds great, but how how are we going to accomplish this? And so the questions that I think need to be framed are around this. So it, first question would be: Is the humanitarian programming cycle, which has the HRP, RMRP, other types of plans? Is that doing that? Is that accomplishing that? I mean, that would be a question to, to ask you. And if it's not, then what has to happen? And, you know, is that is it possible to adapt what exists? Is it I don't think you have to abolish things necessarily, but you have to think, okay, this, this is the new, we created these types of tools 10 years ago or however long it was. And that there were certain conditions then now we're in a new phase. So what what needs to happen? And and we have to pose the question to the to the tools we have as well. So even though we have the data center, uh, for example, what could be done to make that data center data uh, not just accessible to to the organizations? How could uh, a community access that information? How could they see it on a map in their own community? Uh, because we always say the first responder in a disaster is the community, what tools are we giving them, right? So this that that sounds overwhelmingly difficult if you if you look at it from just thinking about our earlier tools. But if we're able to somehow take advantage of all this uh, this new, and I think we have to tackle it with the private sector uh, in a very deliberative and systematic way. We have to go. We have to have them look at the tools that exist too with us and give us advice be humble and um and really look at what's been done and and recognize that there's a lot of room for improvement 
Thank you, Jeff. And once again, Olivier, thank you for your input. Any questions from the audience in the room? Yes, I'll just be running to you. Uh, but then the problem is that those online won't hear you. Hi, uh, I'm Nicholas, uh, data engineer at uh, ACAPS. So I have a question in two parts, perhaps a little bit more uh, on the practical side of things. Uh, so for the project on Colombia, for example, you, you Jeff, talked about um, using the private sector. How much of that project, for example, is internal capacities of IMAP and should those be built? And how much of that is the private sector? And then following up on that, how much of this is thought of as a um, community project where people from other organization, private people, people in tech, how can they contribute to the code, to new features, uh, to new ways of using the data, showing the data and doing something with the data? Thanks. So, I mean, in all the project proposals that we're making, we always include a number of private sector <clears throat> partners. So in this particular case, uh, we have premise data to do the data collection um, um, for certain data collection. So when we when we have to target a place, you know, we don't ask a migrant to go to a specific location to, to tell us what the what assistance is available. We pay someone to do that through premise uh, premises app. So that's a private sector solution. And we've been working with premise for years because it, in when I when I try to sell the private sector, I want to be very clear. And Chris Watson is here as well from premise that it's it's something that has to be worked on between us. Sometimes the humanitarian uh, humanitarians sort of uh, because we have knowledge about certain things, like how do we work with communities, how do we uh, protect them uh, with, with our pr processes. Mm, and sometimes the private sector doesn't have all that experience. So premise has relatively more, but it's a learning process to figure out how to use each tool, every single tool. So in every tool needs to be um, adjusted and improved for this type of purpose. So if we if we want to engage then with Facebook or with uh, with Google or with in, in this project, we also engage with a software development company to do the chatbot development. Right. Um, then we have to have them as partners. The way I see see it is we have to work on things as partners, include them in meetings and consult with them. And um, it doesn't mean IMAP will always be right. It doesn't mean that the private sector partner will always be right. We have to come to a, a, a solution. So that's that's what, and we'll make mistakes along the way. And, and we have to be careful how the relationship is managed. Uh, you know, when that mistake is made, because they're they're made, um, we find the solution. We find the solution, and if everyone's working in good faith, it'll work out. Um, now, at the same time, is, for example, their access to the data uh, there. There's a lot of protection concerns for migrant data. So UNICEF is the one that makes the calls. UNICEF ha is the holder of the money. They've received money from more than one donor, for example, for that project. Um, they have to navigate as well. What is the purpose of this versus, for example, DTM or what DRC is doing in the region with the MMC? Uh, with the mi mixed migration center uh, data, so each so there's a whole bunch of initiatives. You don't want to have duplication, uh, and at the same time, there's restrictions on who the data is being shared with, uh, who needs the data. Probably a lot of organizations need the data. When we when we work with communities, this wasn't my example here, but that's that's also a question. So we the community gives us the data. We need to give it back to them, right? Um, and at the end of the day, you have to figure out what is the safe way to do that to? How do you do that? How do you, if we're talking about a protection issue or, or something like that, they need to understand, they often understand their risks better than we do, obviously. But um, the way they accept and they decide how to deal with risk is different than what we, what we perceive. That's always been an interesting uh, debate to have who is, 
who is protecting who and and what is the responsibility there. Um, I hope I'm answering your question well. Uh, so I don't, yeah, we don't have like access to the data for, for ACAPS or for uh, the, any other organization right now. Um, but I think that it, would, it makes sense like to have certain uh, scenarios like that. Like UNICEF at a global level, they have a, they have different, um, what is the name of that? The the They have tools that allow you to go in and look at their data and also the data they get from the private sector because they get a lot. Um, but like I remember, you have to actually be in New York to get some. <laughs> you have to send someone to work in New York to get which one of the any of you know, remember the name of that? The the box something box that they have in uh, you can get access to a whole bunch of interesting data sets like CDR and other sensitive stuff, but you have to actually go there and see it. So there are mechanisms. My point is, is that there are mechanisms. Sometimes they're not always practical, <laughs> but uh, there are mechanisms that that uh, probably need to be worked on more as well. Like how are we going to how are we going to effectively share this data with whoever needs it, and also avoid duplication because I think that's also a threat to have money spent on getting the data a second time because someone doesn't have access to it. I just, just want to add something. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but this is why we are here. This is why we're asking these questions. We want to know how can we work together. We are extending the hand to other partners, other organizations working in information management. How can we collaborate? How can we do better what we're already doing. And uh, the saying, they say, no man, no man is an island. But yeah, let's let's work together. I know from technical perspective, a lot of collaboration happen. Uh, as an IM, you always reach out to someone. I have this Power BI dashboard that is broken somewhere. How can I fix this? We do talk, you know, on Skype, on Slack, on different platforms informally. And I mean, uh, information management, it's a very small, neat uh, network. People talk to each other. But then what we're asking here, how do we move this from just a technical perspective and put in place the mechanism, the official mechanism, to actually make it happen from the leadership, from organizational perspective? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, just to add up on some of the points raised by the colleague who just asked a question. He was asking uh, part of the, the fact that I might be used is uh, the private sector. Is there some technical uh, 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 capability that we need to absorb or do we need to continue kind of uh, subcontracting that to the partner? So my, I just want to say that uh, if you want to remain humanitarian, we don't need to absorb and develop all of those capacity internally. It will take us too much time. We take into account uh, turnover. People leave one organization to the next one. So there are things that we should not be even trying to develop the capacity internally. If that capacity is already somewhere humanitarian or private, I think we should be able to feel comfortable and go in and use it as long as it's cost effective and I've addressed the problem we are trying to resolve. Thank you. Thank you, Abedin. I think we all agree on that. And I think one of the you know highlights as well of the grand bargain is exactly effective partnership with the private sector without having to own all of those processes, whether it's, you know, the big actors providing, you know, logistics to support to World Food Program. But for us in the ecosystem of information management, it could be the premise, it could be other of the actors that are there as a tech provider, Esri, Olivier is online to build those capacities jointly and together. Yes. Mentioned quite a bit. Uh, there was also somebody writing this on Slido. Uh, we have to avoid duplication. And uh, um, how would we? Is there a, is there a method a process in line? I'm interested in this because I am working on creating a method for consolidation of all sorts of things. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was about who should have access or not in the private sector. I can think it of of a couple of actors, uh, 
might be problematic that they would have access to this, like uh, um, real estate developers, <laughs> or they would know where they would have more of an advantage to build or not. Uh, and also insurers, uh, those would be a bit problematic, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody wants to react to this from the panel? Yeah, I mean, we have to look like how does Creative Commons, for example, deal with these types of issues? Generally speaking, if it's uh, if it's open, my understanding and someone can correct me is that you can use the data for private sector use as well to get money or anything. So the question is, is that you can you can, for example, use data that's in a Creative Commons uh, license for a for profit purpose. So, I mean, the question is going to be, um, is everyone allowed to still have access to that? There are other licensing arrangements like copy left, which I think is interesting, which means you can't. Uh, then there subsequently uh, copyright a uh, an idea or data set with a derivative product. So that can so maybe protect some stuff. Um, but I'm not an expert on the on the different ways that on those licensing arrangements, but we usually do try to publish things with uh, Creative Commons licensing if possible. Thank you. Here's another question. I can uh, just just to add on on what Jeff, I mean, uh, in response to the question, uh, sometimes we just have to look at the greater good. Uh, if making these tools or these data sets to make them available, and they're going to save thousands of life or at the same time they're going to be used by uh, uh, a greedy person for commercial um, purpose uh, i think it's clear i mean sometimes we just can't control these kind of things but then we need to look uh, what we do sometimes like just as an example the tool i showed for afghanistan it's available, yes, it's freely available, but then you need to register, you need to be approved, and then you need to read what are the requirements, the regulation about the use of the tool. So maybe that's what you can do to regulate the use, but then without restricting the, the access. Yeah, over. Hey, I'm Jesse. I'm Global GS Manager at Humanitarian Open Street Map. And one of you mentioned something about that there's no network that's focused on AM, which I that was an interesting idea. And I'm seeing leadership in the middle there. And so I, if any of you want to comment a little bit more about that and like how a network might play a different role than the working groups that we have, you know, the IMWG and yeah. Perfect. Hello, Jesse. Want to take this one? Can take it. I think I'm the one who said it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. I, I misspoke. Not that there is no network, but the collaboration and the way we're doing, the way we are collaborating uh, in information management can be improved. That's what I meant. Yeah. Uh, we have an IM working group. There is a meeting once every month or every two months where we discuss, and then. Usually during the meetings, uh, it's about what this organization did, what the other one did. And I know this question has popped up when they ask, what can we do better? And it's work in progress. But then maybe instead of just waiting to talk once every month, we should have a specific discussion. Maybe, uh, I don't know, a workshop or a one week brainstorming session where actually we focus this discussion on a specific topic of collaboration because we all have some strength and weaknesses. How can we bring together what we are best at? And uh, because in the end, we all work toward a common goal, which is alleviating the suffering of the humanity and the human beings. And yeah, so how can we do that uh, all together? Uh, as far as leadership, I think we always talk about community leadership. My question is, how can we have communities participate in these types of spaces in some way? 
And I don't know exactly what the solution is, but there's definitely more potential for networking. I mean, we're in the uh, we're in the epoch of social media, right? Why why can't we incorporate community leaders in these types of processes? So we have a very traditional I am working group set up with just an H two H kind of relationship. Where is the community? We have organizations that do present the uh, perspectives of the community, but how about we have community leaders appear somehow, you know, depending on the topic or depending on the area, why can't we uh, tap into that local knowledge and have them present in the discussions in some way? Um, and I think there are a lot of tools now available. And so we have to think about what is the potential with social media to bring them in and maybe have a little bit of disruption in our, in our, uh, in our meetings. And all of a sudden have someone pop up and say, oh, hold on, <laughs> listen, we're here on the ground and we don't see this as a priority. What are you guys talking about? And and like maybe have that have us reevaluate what we're doing sometimes. Uh, I would like to ask a question concerning the food security example in Syria. We, you said because you are working from Jordan, so uh, you are working almost like remotely to collect the data. So how do you choose like the communication channel to identify, for example, your partner or business actor? And are there any criteria that you use to identify this issue and ensure like that those criteria can be met even when you are working with them remotely? And the, the second also part regarding that data collection, when you train them, do you train them like remotely or face to face? And later, when they collect the data, how you are able like to ensure that the data quality is reflecting what you want, and also it's reflecting the community needs. So the commu the community need can be engaged really well, like in the data provided to make like to design the program or making like the decision regarding this. Thank you so much. Your good name, please. Uh, Ihsan and I worked actually six years ago, like with UNICEF in Syria. So I worked yes. for a long time in Syria. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank, you, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Ihsan. Uh, it's a very good question. And uh, I did maybe if you have attended the session earlier this week, would have answered all your questions, but good that you raised this, this question. Um, <laughs> we are part of the food security cluster uh, as a partner, basically working on specific product together with some other uh, partners as well, such as REACH. Uh, in terms of the remote data collection uh, or deciding about the data and so on, it's, it's a collective decision among all the partners for North East and North West. So we're not deciding about it. The team or the group for the food security cluster who are the one who decide on what data and what report even needed and what indicators need to be collected first. Uh, second, in terms of the training, we do the training remotely and uh, it's a bit of a challenge. It took some time to be able to learn how to do that in a way that minimize the amount of errors or glitches in the data. And even after the data has been collected or why the data is collected, we have some checkpoints that we created and SOPs that will validate the data and making sure that it works. Uh, this checkpoint has different ways to look at. Like, for example, like uh, one of the simple example, of course, we're using the famous Kobo uh, data collection tool. But then in Kobo, you have the start and end of the 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 session or the interview or the data collection if this for example if this the start and the end of the session the duration of this particular uh, entry is exceeded the expected time for example we're saying that it's going to be one hour uh, questionnaire and uh, if it exceeded the one hour went to like a extra like half an hour or something that means there is an issue either with the training or with the the beneficiary and uh, also if it's less also there is some other issues and this is more serious that means there is cheating there and filling up whatever it is and that's it and also there's some checkpoints other checkpoints example of checkpoints that we're doing i don't want to just uh, go through all of them but at the end of the day this is how we do the feedback and validate the data after the data has been collected we're not 
going ahead and producing the report. We need to run it through the local partners on North East and North West, no local partners, some of them are organization, local organization or international organization to look at the data and to see if it makes sense or no. And if they saw any issues with the data, then we need to do another round of validation. I hope this answered the question. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bello. Any other questions, comments in the room or online? Abdon, yes. Thank you, Guido. Just some thought. Uh, since we are talking about technology and uh, humanitarian, we're looking at the, uh, the survey people mentioned accuracy, data accuracy, timeliness. Uh, how far can we, should we go in terms of using technology to resolve our issues? Sometimes uh, I have the impression that more we try to be accurate using technology, it may take longer to come up with solution to address some situation that may change in a 30 days or 60 day time. And at the same time, uh, you want to get to some level of accuracy. So somewhere there should be a trade-off on how much, because humanitarian work is not a exact science, not always, and it should not be if you are, the reality is changing on the ground. So technology is there, it can allow us to do a lot in a more specific, uh, precise way, where ourselves should we draw the line and say, okay, past this level is a waste of time or it's a waste of resources, just a throw and a, idea there. Thank you. Can I comment to that? Please go. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Abdul, for this uh, example, especially for the timeline. Um, um, maybe you're all aware of the recent uh, incidents in Sudan, the conflict that's ongoing for the past 12 days. And I'm part of a voluntary team that they're doing some sort of a quick response in terms of data, especially for the pharmacies or the health facilities like pharmacies or uh, hospitals and so on, because there is a lot of hospitals and pharmacies that are not functioning. And the data need to be collected rapidly to respond because like every day it counts. And uh, we had like, we started like some sort of a, a, a WhatsApp group and to think about how we can work on that. And me as I am person, I've been involved in that. And there are some developers, there are like mobile application developers, some kind of fancy uh, technology that they would like to help. And one of the thing that they started to think of, okay, why don't we do like a mobile application that you be there and then you can collect this specific point and so on. And it's like kind of a complicated thing. It's going to be really fancy, but it's not going to end up in like two or three days. And the other options that I recommend it, let's put in a Google sheet with some columns, let people fill in whatever information they have, and then we can respond quickly. The guys, now is the 12th day of the crisis or the 13 days since the conflict started, they didn't finish it till now. Our tool, the simple Google tool with a simple dashboard that take right away from the Google tool is more efficient and more used by the the the, the public there. And this is like an example of what what just uh, Abdul mentioned. So it's kind of a balance based on like if it's especially if it's a humanitarian and it's some need some sort of a quick response. It's not like when you're talking about something for development, for example, and like might take longer time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abdul. Yes. Um, to follow up on what you said, um, if uh, information is given to uh, such actors as uh, real estate developers or insurers or other parties who would uh, use that information to essentially extract value from uh, local resources and local the local population, then um, uh, the local population and uh, the country should uh, be informed in at, at par, on par with with uh, these private actors, in order to defend themselves uh, appropriately against such exploitation. <laughs> that was my thought following what you said. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, all of the systems and tools that we've been presenting today, again, are strictly compliant with in interagency standards in terms of mitigating any risk of exposing data protection and, and any other sort of sensitive data that could actually be misused because otherwise we would put ourselves 
and the people that we're trying to serve in 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 situations that we really want to avoid to do that. So that is that is something that I can I can confirm that that is the case. Um, any other questions or comments? Yes, please. Let me run again. I didn't have my coffee today yet, so well this afternoon I had them this morning. Uh, hi, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Lukasz Kruk. I'm with the REACH initiative. We are huge fans of IMAP, obviously. Thank you very much for the for the presentation and the, and the very interesting examples. Uh, I have a little bit complex question. I'll, it's going to be a little bit of a build up to it, but uh, I'll try to make it clear. So I really like the examples you guys give of uh, technological solutions to information management uh, challenges, right? Like if I see an online GIS platform that is built on open source, that encourages participation, that uh, you guys really make a good job of advocating for it and inviting us to 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 look at it. I think that's great. Uh, this, this really ticks all the right boxes in my mind. Uh, but looking at this uh, word cloud of challenges, like the biggest one is obviously leadership. And I think any technological platform that exists, doesn't matter how good it is, it can be absolutely fantastic and really solve all the issues from the technological perspective. Sooner or later, it's going to uh, crash against the challenge of uh, world leadership or authority or UN endorsements and all of us essentially having to collectively agree that, you know, this is the source of truth. This is what we say is, I don't know, the, the the name of the admin boundary or the number of affected people in a particular camp or whatever other data fact you, 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 you want to uh, agree on. Uh, so the question would be, what is your experience in uh, gaining those endorsements? Because sooner or later, this has to go into HNO, it has to inform the humanitarian response plan, and you need OCHA to rubber stamp the any particular figure, any particular name, any particular P code. So how does that conversation go? What's the best way for this conversation to be efficient, effective, and productive? Thank you. That's a great question, and I see that the panel is silent now. <laughs> Who wants to take it? <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, I don't know, that's a billion dollar question. Uh, so what I can say, so far, how we do, we, we talk to the people in charge of leadership, and in terms of I am usually, coordination is done usually by OCHA, and uh, we have the different IM working group at country level, and there are these discussions where we go, we look at the issues, we look at the challenges, we try to solve them together. And uh, when I say together, it's different actors in information management. Uh, but then uh, what is lacking for me, that's just my personal perspective, is having these mechanisms more on a global level where we have this different framework, like what Olivier said, don't we need the GIS framework, you know, have this mechanism in place so that they can quickly be activated whenever there is a need, instead of uh, there is an earthquake today and then we spend two weeks having meetings and meetings and meetings, and then after two or three weeks of meetings, uh, decide, oh, okay, who's going to be doing and this, who's going to do that. And then after four weeks, you realize that the admin three level boundaries are not correct in the country, when actually you could have gotten this years or months before. And, you know, if we had this mechanism that can be activated on the spot, that would be much easier. Imagine just a simple example. I showed the example of Afghanistan. Imagine if we had the same thing for the Horn of Africa. This is a region where we have recurring issues, drought, uh, flooding, um, I don't know, conflicts. There is a lot of things happening in the area. And it seems we don't learn. We keep making the same mistake. We keep uh, reacting to issues instead of being proactive. Imagine if we had all this population data uh, 
rain and all this information already available, already preset, all these admin boundaries already preset months or years before actually a disaster hits. Can you imagine how many lives will be saved, you know, instead of just waiting at the last minute and then to try to to get funding and write proposals and spend weeks and months writing proposals to get funds to save lives when actually these lives could be saved before. Uh, one last point, just giving the same example. Imagine Horn of Africa. Uh, we have like these talking about new technology like Earth observation. Uh, Earth observation where we can use satellite imagery and we can detect uh, surface water level in in a country or across multiple countries right and then you can actually detect uh, a drought months or two or three or four months before the drought happens and if we can have these early warning systems in place then we can see something is going to happen we can avoid nutrition issues we can put in place uh, can work with these organizations like WFP. They can already start prepositioning life-saving food or non-food items before actually the crisis happens. So, and even beyond the humanitarian response, when you think about the cost effectiveness, it's much cheaper than responding when it's already too late. So, yeah, uh, I don't have one solution or one fit all kind of solution. But I think it's really high time. This is why we're having this discussion. It's high time we we challenge ourselves. Uh, I remember when we made the title of this discussion where we say revolutionizing, and we're like, there is revolution. Why are you using revolution? But I guess, yeah, let's challenge ourselves and let's look at let's look at our actions in the mirror and say, hey, can how can we do better? Yeah. And as well, taking one step backwards from the technology component, which I fully agree with your statement. I think our role as well, and you know, with REACH, with other partners, with Hot Humanitarian OpenStreetMap and, and the private sector, for us to actually empower our other actors as well and, and, and scale up as, an, as a community to help all these information management systems and processes get where they need to be in terms of the data flows, in terms of making sure that the accuracy of the data, the timeliness of how the data is collected are not only then relying on a system or in a software, but can actually be then interoperable, can be actually shared, can actually be made available through APIs to other systems so that we avoid duplicating the software infrastructure. And the way, as you probably know, IMAP operates were project-based. So that level of endorsement that you're mentioning, we do obtain it at the country level. There's no ambition then to, to, to scale it up at the global level. But at the country level, these processes that we've outlined here today as examples are ways for us to push the boundary of how the traditional definition of information management was defined 15 years ago in the HPC can actually be actionable. And they do fit inside you know, the planning processes within the HNOs and so on and so forth. We do engage with the clusters. We do engage with OCH at the country level. And again, to make sure that we are enabling their mandate in terms of coordination and making sure that we are serving with data actors for the better good. Welcome. Questions, comments? Online, I think we have nothing for now. Yeah. Is there anybody online who wants to step in and unmute? Yeah, comment or question, anything? Abdon, yes. Thank you. The last question, even though we are talking about humanitarian context here, when we talk about leadership, uh, the tool we develop, um, I like your idea to have a way of uh, transferring the data somewhere so that uh, tomorrow we don't go back and uh, uh, restart from afresh. So that's where the ownership also uh question is but is i don't see as a humanitarian it cross into the next year's in the development because when a crisis goes down everybody leaves um humanitarian pack their luggage and then humanitarian uh, donor also lives and they leave the space to the development actors but so far where we are in front from what we see is that whatever data set is created during an humanitarian uh, 
uh, emergencies or set up after 10 years, five years, when development actors come, they don't even think about going and see what's there. They will restart from scratch. That's why, so there's, uh, there should be a way we can transfer whatever knowledge was acquired during humanitarian and pass it on. I don't know if you go to the government because that's the only institution that does never leave, stay there, so that when the development actors come, they can pick it up from there. And then when a crisis like those are kind of uh, up and down comes, you return and you still have some data that are still valid, but we are not there. So that's a whole area of uh, thinking that uh, we don't have an answer for, for now. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul. And actually that links very well to what I wanted to ask the panel members and it was not planned. So thank you for raising that. You mentioned technology and the challenges of it, and Abdin, you mentioned as well the transfer of ownership. And my question to the panel members is, what are the risks and challenges as well of these systems, of these processes? Because again, you know, it requires capacity, it requires skills, it requires knowledge, it requires tech setups. And often in, in the context where we operate, those are not necessarily all the time available at the local level, there's challenges in that regards. So how can we as well be better prepared as a humanitarian community from an IM perspective to make sure that whatever you guys have presented, and thanks again, can actually be scalable, can actually be used when we leave, when we're not there. So again, what are the risks and what are the challenges for the work that you guys presented in just literally one minute each? Who wants to start? Yeah, you have the microphone there. Thank you. So I still I see I still see it more as an opportunity than a risk. Although there's always obviously risks. The biggest one is that you just fail. <laughs> so that can always happen. You have to be able to adapt. And um, but the but the question I have is that the way we're doing things now is not sustainable and it's not cost effective lots of times. So to be able to, we aren't scaled now, like humanitarians aren't scaled, uh, aren't scaled. They, they don't cover all, the entire area of any emergency practically. Uh, there's always huge areas left out. And so um, I think the potential exists for having cost efficient uh, new uses of technology that we haven't thought of that will allow us to have a much greater reach. So one of the things I thought was funny was with uh, the CTO of NRC was explaining what their biggest problem with the WhatsApp chatbot to identify beneficiaries for Ukrainians was, and it was that they had too many people registered. <laughs> so they had 600,000 people registered, which I thought was amazing. And, uh, and so they had all these people profiled. I mean, the, imagine how many people they know where they are they can ask them where they are uh, then you have the question like who can you share the information with because they have this first mover advantage of getting all that and they have all the consent what did how did they structure their consent for ukrainians like can other humanitarians use that that's one, those are questions then that uh need to be answered as well so there's a risk that like NRC is the only organization that understands all Ukrainians' needs everywhere in Eastern Europe. That's kind of, I don't know, weird. Um, for me, it's funny. It shouldn't be funny, but it's, but um, that's my sense of humor. <laughs> 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 but in any case, that's, uh, that's, but, you know, I still see it more as an opportunity, but obviously, yeah, you have to navigate a lot of new issues whenever a new technology comes out. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I might see it like with two flip coin. Like first, it's accounting because like we suppose working on the humanitarian, which is a, a short term. And that means that the response need to be quick, as I mentioned before, and uh, the technology need to be efficient, cost efficient. And at the same time, opportunity for something like or for an, an organization like IMAP that things could be also replicated in different crises, like, uh, for example, like the knowledge management exchange that uh, led by IMAP as well, like 
sharing the different technologies among different crises and see is the usability, how things can be replicated in another context. For example, like the food security components that we have in Jordan, now it's already, we're trying to work in on how to replicate that with uh, in Ukraine, for example. Although it's not the same crisis, not the same needs and so on, but something that can be also taken there and then can be replicated. So it's a kind of a two-way thing for my for me. Petron? Thank you very much. Um, for me, uh, the biggest risk, I mean, there are countless of risk, but the biggest risk is in action. If we continue doing things the way we are doing, uh, the way we've been doing the past 10, 15, 20 years, it will not work out. Uh, technology is moving, the world is moving, we need to move with it. So we need to discuss about these challenges. This can only happen if we sit together and talk and try to to figure out what's missing and how can we get better. And this is the only way we can actually identify this specific risk and put in place mitigation measures. Uh, I know as human beings, we are we always resisting to change. We always talk about change management, but let, let's, let's do it. Let's include localization. Let's not just say it, localization in words, but let's leave it let's involve the local communities let's bring them to the table it's sad that you know the actual people who are benefiting for our systems are not sitting here in this room let's invite them let's bring them together let's bring them here and then let's share let's share our ideas our systems our data we talked about interoperability let's make our systems talk each other talk to each other and avoid duplication and save the cost and that's, those savings could be used for better use for saving lives, yeah. Uh, thanks again for everyone, yeah. Well, I mean, you said it all. It's a very good way to wrap it up, I would say. <laughs> so thank you. Unless there's one last question, one last comment in the room online. You did it very well, Bertrand, the wrapping up, so I won't add anything. Thank you very much, uh, Bertrand, Jeff, Bello. And thank you for those who are online as well. Thank you.